The creation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1834 led to a long-term commitment to social engineering experiments with the Indians, based on radically different assumptions, methods, and goals at different periods of history, but creating dependency throughout. After the Civil War, for example, the federal government found itself feeding 100,000 Indians. The net result was that large numbers of formerly energetic and aggressive warriors became enervated and dispirited recipients of the dole. While national policies toward the Indians were formulated in Washington, often under the influence of idealistic but uninformed humanitarian movements in the East, these policies were carried out on the reservations by federal agents who were often neither idealistic nor humanitarian, but were instead political appointees, less known for their ability than for their connections, and often less interested in the well-being of the Indians than in their own opportunities for lucrative corruption. Indeed, the prospect of living on a bleak Indian reservation was not one likely to attract able and honest men with alternatives elsewhere, though the job of federal agent there could be very attractive to men who were the opposite of able and honest. The hostility of the white population in the West toward the Indian, and the impatience of these local whites to acquire more of the vast amounts of land required for the Plains Indians' way of life, were crucial ingredients in the mixture of motives and pressures which produced the turbulent era of Indian-white armed conflict from the mid-nineteenth century to the last decade of that century. In Alaska, where there were vast expanses of unused land readily available for white settlers without dispossessing the native Eskimos, there was no organized warfare on either side, no reservations set aside for the indigenous people, and no campaigns for treaties to transfer title to the land on which the Eskimos lived, at the same time when all these things were going on in the American West under the same national government. In Canada, the peaceful settlement of whites on the land was for a long time more like what happened in Alaska than like what happened in the rest of the United States, but only until the growing number of whites attracted to the Canadian frontier found the available land no longer sufficient for their development and when the Indians began to experience diminished opportunities for hunting game. From that point on, the history of white Indian relations in Canada began to follow a pattern similar to that in the United States, including an armed uprising in 1885, treaties to transfer Indian lands to whites, and the creation of Indian reservations to remove the indigenous peoples as a distraction or an obstacle to the development of the country. In the United States, Easterners appalled by stories of the cheating, oppression, and violence against Indians in the West, and convinced that Indians could be educated and taught the skills needed to adjust to the kind of life lived in American society, launched programs to train them to do just that, both through government and through private humanitarian undertakings. These schemes of social engineering included getting Indians to substitute farming for the hunting that was rapidly depleting the buffalo herds and other game which in turn would mean that the Indian population could feed itself by agricultural produce on much less land than that required for hunting, thereby allowing surplus Indian land to be sold to whites and for the West to be developed economically. Only on the transfer of Indian land was there unanimity between whites in the East and the West, as well as among the humanitarians, the speculators, and the politicians. Not surprisingly, this was the only part of the grand schemes for the Indians' future that was carried out successfully. Forcibly herding Indians onto reservations proved to be a difficult and protracted process, and keeping them there was often even more difficult, given the limitations of the land and the unfamiliarity of the whole way of life that others had designed for the Indians. This way of life was in fundamental conflict with the Indians' habits and their cultural values. Farming, for example, was regarded by many of the Plains Indian men as demeaning, while hunting, raiding, and fighting were time-honored roles. Moreover, so long as buffalo herds remained a valuable economic asset and the federal government supplied rations and annuities, incentives to change were lessened. The problem was not one of the whole white race against the whole indigenous race, for neither side was monolithic. Moreover, blacks were a significant presence in the American West particularly as soldiers after the Civil War, as they had been a significant presence as slaves of both Indians and whites in the antebellum South. 
Despite the bitter hostility between whites and Indians on the American frontier, both during the era when the frontier was east of the Mississippi and later when it was out on the western plains, the humanitarian movements of eastern whites, which had great effect on the general direction of both governmental and private efforts to aid and assimilate the Indians, was equally real, even if often unrealistic in its goals and methods. The first American program for the preferential hiring of minorities began in the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the early 19th century, where Indians were to be preferred as employees, a preference reaffirmed over the years in successive waves of legislation until the federal government became the principal employer of educated Indians. These were enduring patterns. As of 1940, sixty percent of the five thousand employees of the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs were Indians and the 1980 census revealed that a higher percentage of Indians than of any other American ethnic group worked for the federal government.